So it sounds like part of your discovery process is like being a podcast host. <laughs> yeah, very much like being a podcast host. You know, a great question asked at the right time, followed by silence, is the most effective tool I've found in my arsenal by far. Generally speaking, um, oftentimes cult consultants feel a need as they show up into a circumstance to be smart. Right? And, and, and so sometimes consultants will show up with a design to impress. And I, you know, I show up with a design to ask really good questions and then remain silent, silent and let that silence do all the work. And then just follow up the answer with another question, similar to what you're doing with me, right? So yeah, brilliant. Mark Musselman is the founder of MX5 Consulting which has been helping seven to 11 figure brands get unstuck over the last 15 years. Prior to that, he ran a multi-generational family business with several hundred employees until unfortunately he had to file for bankruptcy. So in this interview, we talk about his experience with the bankruptcy and with his consulting On the bankruptcy side. We talk about how he felt about it and what were some of the things he learned from it and what led him to becoming a consultant. And on the consultant side, we talk about things like how do you find clients? How do you communicate with them? How do you make them feel like you care about them without being salesy and much, much more. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Mark. I know I did, and I look forward to seeing what you say in the comments. Thank you and enjoy. Consulting is something that everyone wants to do, but very few are actually good at. What made you want to get into consulting? That's a great question. Uh, I think the, the thing that prompted me to get into it was when I was running my family's business at a very young age. I was 30 years old when I took over my family's business. I knew enough to know that there were things I didn't know. And across the leadership team that had been assembled to kind of run this business, which is at that time a $30 million business, roughly 300 people. Uh, I knew that they had gaps as well. So I was aware that with these gaps, we had to find a way to close them. And we could either do that internally, hiring somebody sort of full time who had that skill set to come in and, and address those gaps, or we could reach out to people who had that as a singular focus. So um, I began as the CEO of the business after my father had retired and he was not prone to bringing in anybody, but we were a successful company. And so I began to hire and really appreciate the value that an extraordinarily skilled consultant could have on our business. So as a thing, like we were a manufacturing with high cube storage, we didn't know what we needed to know about high cube storage. So we brought a consulting firm in, to help us specifically address that issue as an example. And so I began to get this relationship and appreciation for consulting. And so when my family's business ultimately, you know, unfortunately in 2008, nine went through bankruptcy, I jumped into consulting because I knew enough of what I could offer in value to other companies that were like mine. So from what I remember, I believe your company went into bankruptcy Yes, in 2008, 2009. And so what was the end result? Did you sell that company? Did you get out of bankruptcy? Did you just fold? What happened with it? Because you said you moved into consulting. So it seems like you moved away from that business. Yeah, so what happened actually is that um, we were an asset-based lending you know, funded business, had a partnership with uh, a very large bank. I'll leave them nameless. And they got nervous as we came in in 2008, 2009 with sort of the condition of our finances, a complicated story, but long story short is that they called our note. Um, at that time we had a $11 million revolving line of credit. We had about 6.5 million outstanding. And when they called it, we couldn't meet it because of the timing of the year. And we went into this whole thing basically, which is forbearance. Um, during that forbearance period, I went out and found a private equity group who ultimately bought the debt from Wells Fargo and then leveraged the full value of that debt through the bankruptcy process. So I actually took the business through the bankruptcy process 
on behalf of what they refer to as a stalking horse, you know, partner. So that's who the private equity showed up being. What what that's to do is basically cleans up the balance sheet, you know, all those things, uh, resolves the debts and encumbrances. And I stayed on for about 12 months, roughly, helping this new ownership group operate a business. Um, they had been in our industry. They had owned a couple companies that were ancillary to what we did. And so, um, but they didn't know exactly what we did and how we were doing it. So I stayed on and that's, that's it. So it just sold in January uh, under the new ownership, I think for like $60 million. So um, it worked out well for them. My family lost the ownership. All the employees were made whole and complete. Many of them stayed on, most of them did. The deal was we just lost ownership in the business. How did that make you feel? Wow. Yeah, it's a great question. <laughs> um, it is something that was the most challenging period of my life without a question. And there's lots of reasons for that. I think the biggest thing that I walked away from in the experience was the loss of the business, but also for me, the loss of identity, the loss of, you know, this sense of looking good, this, this, you know, so many things that I would identify myself. I was as a result of being in the Denver metro area, owning a business, you know, we were uh, a, a manufacturer in the United States, had a couple hundred employees. All those things are, you know, um, they're notable. Uh, when manufacturing jobs in the 90s and the 2000s were going away from the States, we were building and growing a manufacturing business. And so um, I, I had an elevated position in the community and then all that just collapsed. It was really, really difficult. I tell my kids all the time that I feel like I, I, I literally lost um, 10 years of my life because for 18 months, roughly my entire body was bathed in cortisol and adrenaline every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I couldn't escape it. And, uh, so it was, it was really, really, really difficult. Well, I can't say that I've been in that severe of a situation or that complicated of a situation. But I, I feel like I can understand how you feel in regards to the stress, the long-term stress. I did my last company for four and a half years and I felt that every day yeah. because I had invested my own money and I had investors and I had a team of 17 and we were trying so hard to build this thing and launch it and get money from investors. And it was very complicated. So, I, you know, Dealing with a bankruptcy must have been far more complicated and difficult. And after leaving that company over the last year, I've been kind of trying to figure out, you know, who am I now? Because before I was the founder and CEO of Nerve. Right. Well, the company doesn't exist anymore. So who the hell am I? I'm the founder and CEO of We Live to Build. Right. What does that mean? It's a podcast. What does that mean? Right. It's just right. What, what does that, what's the, that's the foundation. The podcast is the foundation of it. What I'm going to do with it next. That's what matters. But the, I think fi from a financial standpoint, which you were referring to as well, you had a, a, a position in community that was elevated. When I was doing my consulting before I got into the startup, I was making incredible money to a point where I could basically buy anything I wanted to anything I could think of. I could, I could afford it right then and there in cash. No problem. And when the industry changed and I walked away from that business, I also stopped making money like that. And when I started then turning and putting that money into the startup, not only was I not making big money anymore, I was spending big money with no income stream to replenish it. And that's one of the reasons why I think I became so stressed. And so I was, I was losing my identity as I am someone who charges a lot of money, does big things, helps big companies, and can afford anything I want to. Now I'm living bare bones, trying to spend as little as I can to put as much money as I can wisely into my business. And so my identity shifted from there as well. Yeah. Um, I used to go on business class flights, and now I take economy. Like that was hard. Yeah, I, I, people don't realize if you've if you've never flown business, like there's something <laughs> special about the experience. There's something special about 
lounges. And there's something special about flatbeds over, you know, the ocean and, you know, fresh wine and fresh espresso, fresh espresso and freshly made meals on the plane for you. To going back to like being on a car, it, it's, it really, it, it does, it does affect you. It's like, oh, like the first few times I had to do economy again, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm with like everybody else again. And that sounds horrible, but it's a fact of life, you know? Yeah, I think there's, yeah, I think there's a certain, um, I'll use the word luxuries that do become part of that. And, you know, I, I can lose myself and my identity inside that if I'm not careful, right? So I think a couple things, you know, like I said, I was 30 years old when I took over running this family business and, and the business was a successful business, had a lot of cash it was generating. And, um, and we were a darling of our bank. So like the bank would take groups of people up to the Ritz Carlton up in Beaver Creek, which is about as posh as you can get. And of course we were, you know, in that top group of people invited up into that experience and just all the trappings. That's the best word that I can use. It's like all these trappings of the role of the significance, et cetera. And then in a nanosecond, just gone. And then you're left looking yourself in the, in the mirror, right? Saying, you know, who am I? You know, what matters to me? I, and I, like you went through windows of time where I had no, I had, as, as has been said, I had less than no money, right? You know, there's having no money and then there's having less than no money. And I, I went from having plenty of money to less than no money and four kids at the time, you know, an incredibly understanding and supportive wife during that window. Uh, but the stress and the strain was extraordinary, right? And then, and then you're confronted, I'm confronted with this notion that we need to reinvent ourselves, right? And, and it's almost like taking a chalkboard, a blank slate and saying, okay, here's who I've been. Who do I want to be now? And that's the time in which I, you know, basically move from CEO of a family owned manufacturing company to a consultant, an advisor. And then that kind of grew into and evolved into a executive business coach. And I went directly to family owned businesses initially because we were a multi-generational family owned business. So I like, okay, where can I find clients? I'll find clients that I can understand that I can speak to that. I've lived through that experience, all the challenges and the trappings of, you know, being part of a family owned business. And it's got so many rewards and gifts and it's got some other stuff too. So that was the reinvention for me. So yeah, my, for me, the positioning I'm thinking of is companies that are doing SaaS e-commerce and service because it's what I know. Like you tell me, oh, go serve an enterprise company doing a billion dollars a year in revenue. I don't understand them. How am I going to sell them on my product? It just, it, you know, it doesn't make sense. Plus uh, you had mentioned earlier, working with six, seven, eight figure businesses, they're easier to work with easier to form personal relationships with and easier to get them to listen to your advice and take action on the strategy because they're paying for it. And when they pay, it's enough to hurt them if they don't. So what exactly was it that you wanted to focus on with consulting when you were approaching these companies? You know, so for, for me, I'm looking at the a cost optimization as an example. What was the thing that you wanted to focus on with them? Well, I think the thing that I wanted to do and that I have, you know, been able to sustainably do for approaching, you know, 15 years now is be, uh, come into an organization that felt like it was stuck. We were as a business stuck. And what I mean by that is having something that we knew was getting in the way of our business living into its full potential and really not having the ability to see it because when at that whole forest and the trees analogy, right, we were so much in the business that we couldn't get out of the business to look at and say, Oh, that's it. So what I've enjoyed is coming into organizations um, and helping them, you know, go up to a different elevation, look at it through a different lens and perspective to help them identify what that thing or those things are. And then really, work at removing those barriers, whatever it might be. And sometimes I partner with other consulting groups when it falls into a range or an area that is outside my expertise. I, I love to collaborate. Uh, but mine is really with creating the conversation that has them getting out of what is mostly the condition, which is pretense, right? There's a lot of leaders and business owners who 
they, they you know, I'll just use it, they lie and they pretend, you know, and, and they're trying to avoid the thing that's right in the way because they don't want to name it. So I can come in and create mostly as access, oddly enough, as a result of my experience going through bankruptcy. You wouldn't think this, but it's very disarming. To have a conversation with a business owner where their biggest fear is going out of business, to tell them I've gone through it and and it was painful and ugly and all and, and it's all of a sudden it's like wow okay I don't really have to do anything to overly impress you right if I don't have to overly impress you I can get honest with you right and then when we're honest we get into that level of conversation that really begins to expose the things that are getting in the way so that's that's been my sort of um, way of serving clients and then that often spills over into one-to-one -one work with the CEO or people on his or her leadership team. So that's, that's my niche. So I've been exploring the idea of copywriting and part of it is understanding the level of awareness that your prospect may have. Hmm. And so if a prospect is less aware, you're more likely to tell them a story in order to get them to bite, which it sounds is like what you do. Yep. So am I to understand that they, they're not totally aware or they're maybe semi aware that they have a problem? Yeah, absolutely. So if that's the case, how do you get them to through your story, recognize that they have a problem That's a great. so that you can then open them up to a discovery of how do we solve this problem? Yeah, I mean, usually the use of stories comes after I've had a chance to be in a conversation. I'm listening to what's going on, asking some, you know, obviously probing questions. And then I, you know, might say, well, you know, go on a little bit more about that thing. And then they'll share whatever they share. And I'd say, you know, I'm going to share a story with you. And, and, you know, just all I want you to do at the end of this story is, you know, share back with me why you think I told you that story. And, and, and what, if any, relevance does the story I just told you have to do with your business? I don't want to give them any answer. I want them to listen to the story and then kind of process. And, 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 you know, and, I, and I will never you know, say that's not right. I just say, okay, say, tell me more about that. You know, what about that story triggered that for you? Because usually when you go down that path, the crumbs are, you know, obvious enough to know that you're getting to the point of something that's real. You know, it's no different than if I gave you a book and 10 other people that I know a book and said, I'd like you to read this book. All 11 of you are going to have a different interpretation of the book, right? There's nobody who's going to have the same. And if I said to you, hey, Sean, tell me about what you drew from that book. You'd, it, you'd tell me what you'd tell me. And then I'd ask the other 10 people and they'd give me a totally different and unique answer. And all of them are right. I just want to be curious, like, tell me why that stood out for you. You know, what was it about that that, you know, had you thinking about your business? And it's in that level of inquiry that I usually find the thing that they're either not seeing or they want to hide. Hey, just give me 10 seconds of your time. I really appreciate you listening to the episode so far, and I hope you're loving it. And if you are, I would love to ask you to subscribe to the channel because what we do is a lot of work. And every week we bring you a new guest and a new story. And what we do requires so much love so that we can bring you something amazing. And every week we're trying really hard to get better guests that have better stories and improve our ability to tell their stories. So your subscription lets the algorithm know that what we're doing is fantastic and no commitment it's free to do and if you don't like what we're doing later on you can always unsubscribe and either way we would love a like if you don't feel like subscribing at this time thank you very much and we'll take you back to the show now so it sounds like part of your discovery process is like being a podcast host <laughs> yeah very much like being a podcast host you know a great question asked at the right time, followed by silence, is the most effective tool I've found in my arsenal, by far. Especially because when you have silence, the person isn't sure if you're going to say anything. And if you don't, then they feel the pressure to fill in the gaps. Absolutely. There's a, and if you keep remaining silent, they'll, they'll keep giving you more information. Right. There's a woman named Susan Scott who wrote 
a great book called Fierce Conversations. And she has her own consulting firm and it's international. They do an amazing job with their consulting. In her book, there's a quote that she talks about when she does consulting and advising, say, let silence do the heavy lifting. Right. And so I think I'll just say, generally speaking, um, oftentimes cult consultants feel a need as they show up into a circumstance to be smart. Right. And, and, and so sometimes consultants will show up with a design to impress. And I, you know, I show up with a design to ask really good questions and then remain silent, silent and let that silence do all the work and then just follow up the answer with another question similar to what you're doing with me. Right. So yeah, brilliant. It's funny because a lot of people feel like when you go to do something related to sales, that you should be telling people like what they want to hear, but oftentimes they do so much talking that the person doesn't want to work with them because they feel like this person doesn't know anything about me. They don't know what my motivations are. They don't know why. I mean, maybe they're not even thinking that deeply, but they just feel something is off. And so when you spend most of your time letting the person do the talking and prompting them, you're actually building an emotional relationship with them because people like to talk about themselves. And so if you minimize what you say only to the most important things, generally, when you repeat what they've just said, they, they feel heard, they feel appreciated, they feel respected, and they want to talk with you more because you're getting them to talk about themselves and then letting them know that you understand them. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I tell this to people all the time, and you're right on with that, that, you know, they've said the greatest human need is connection. I think that if it is the greatest need, there's a need that's right alongside of that, which is to be fully heard and understood and gotten. And so the experience that you can create for another human being by asking a great question and then fully listening to them is the experience of being heard, understood and gotten. And I think, you know, I, I began my career for a company called Ernest and Julio Gallo and, you know, back in the late eighties when I came out of university and they did not let us in that era of training get in front of a customer until we had mastered the skill of effective questions, which are open ended questions. We drilled on that for months. And then when we had that skill set down, they let us go into the market. So when we showed up and met with a customer, it's like, you know, what's the one thing you and I should be talking about today relative to your store? Boom. They'd answer. Well, tell me more about that. Boom. They'd answer. Well, you know, what do you think some solutions might be for that? Boom. They'd answer. And all I had to do is follow the answers to every single question. And pretty soon, if you're really skilled at it, they sell themselves on and you don't even have to do anything other than meet them where they are. So yeah, you and I are on the exact same page with that. So I, I've never worked for another company doing consulting, but I think the single greatest thing my mom did for me was teach me to never accept a yes or a no as the final answer to always go into, but why is it yes? Or why is it no? Like, what's your reasoning behind it? What more do I need to know that helped you to reach that answer? And it's that desire for more information that makes me want to ask people questions. Yeah. I'm one, I just, man, I was smiling because I've got four kids and I'm imagining what that looked like with your mom. Why mom? Why? You know, that whole, <laughs> which kids, you know, are curious and they'll ask a string of whys until they get to what they want to know. Right. And, uh, but you're yeah, spot on. And I say this openly. I, when I first got into this world of consulting and coaching, I'll just say in advising, I've apologized to every single client I had in that first couple of years because I was operating a out of a wounded ego. Somebody who'd just come out of bankruptcy has the CEO, very visible, very painful. And I overreacted by trying to impress my clients with what I knew. And it took me a couple of years to realize you got to just be quiet. Nobody cares really about what you know, what they want to tell you is what they need and why they're stuck or in pain or haven't been able. That's the, and so I just, but it took me a couple of years to get there because I felt like I needed to basically 
um, make up for whatever mistake I felt I had made as the CEO that went through bankruptcy with the company. So, yeah. I feel like the podcast has been the single greatest opportunity for me to hone those skills mm. of curiosity. I mean, I'll, I've spent my entire life learning everything I possibly can and traveling to many countries, but it's a different kind of curiosity to be able to just spend an hour asking someone questions and then to be able to do that like I, I have, I have maybe 10 recordings this month. So it's like almost 10 hours that I get to just ask questions um, mm. from people of different parts of the world, different age groups, different religious backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, different language, you know, native languages, yeah. different expertises. And I just get to ask them questions. And it's, it's, I think if, if anyone wants to be an advisor or a coach or a consultant or a leader of any kind, they need to have that skill. Like my ex-wife used to complain. She said that I, it felt like we weren't having a conversation, but rather I was just waiting for her to finish what she was saying. So I could then say what I wanted to say. Right. And I didn't know what to do with that because she didn't want to listen to me talk, but she wanted me to listen to her talk. And I felt like I gave her all of my time and energy to, to listen to that. And I had just started the podcast when soon before we broke up yeah. before we got towards and so now i've had three years in hundreds and hundreds of hours of listening hmm. and and asking questions and i feel like i would be a better partner to someone now because of that yeah i love that and i you know i share i was married for 27 years and went through a divorce five years ago and you know i think what you just said is not uncommon at all, right? That sense of um, what you've acquired as a set of skills through listening from hosting, if you could apply that to, you know, a romantic or intimate relationship with somebody as a partner, oh my goodness, that's an enormous shift from how I once occurred and it sounds like how you were once occurring as well inside that relationship. So I think it's the same skill set, right? So um, I, I, I love how you've used what all what you've learned, you know, to master that skill. And as you pivot into that world of consulting, a hundred percent of those skills will come in. Uh, they'll be invaluable. That's the goal, I think. Well, I was doing consulting years ago, but I was doing consulting in Chinese with Chinese customers. So it was a, a different cultural context for the communication where there was very little communication actually. It was very much, this is what I need, go do it. And like the, the most amount of time was just spent convincing them that I could do it and then telling them they could talk to a previous client if they wanted to. And then they'd yeah. be like, yeah, all right, fine. So yeah. I feel like in a Western environment, you're actually building a human relationship that in China like wasn't really seen as necessary. Like it's, mm. it's kind of necessary to build a human relationship when you want to do business long term. But if you're consulting, there's kind of not really a need for it. Where in the yeah. West, I feel like you need to build that relationship before they'll give you money. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And, you know, I, and I, I think the thing that we have an opportunity here to live into is I think it's the lifetime value of the relationship, not just in the service that can be provided with one client, but, you know, if done extremely well, you know, that relationship can spawn into many other referred relationships. I, you know, I, I probably have five clients of mine, if I thought about it, who are responsible for about 95% of my business, you know, from the referral side. And, and that's, I always say, slowing down to the speed of the relationship, not the transaction, right? So every single thing that I'm doing is working on what can I do to enhance the quality of the relationship yeah. Oh, and then there might be some business that is part of that as well, but it's always about the relationship. And I learned a lot of that, you know, part of the last 15 years, I've stepped out of being a consultant day to day and I've stepped into the role of running a real estate company, a, a residential real estate brokerage here in, in town. And I learned a ton about sort of that sense of caring for clients because realtors the really good ones do it better than anybody I've ever met in any profession. They're extraordinary yeah. at, you know, um, that piece, that relationship, the cultivation of 
a great client. And so I, I give my, my tip, my hat to anybody who's a extremely effective realtor because they do it better than anybody and everyone can learn from them for sure. So how can you establish a personal relationship with these prospects, sharing your stories, listening to them, helping them to figure out what the problems are in a timely fashion so as to get them to sign the contract, pay you and get started? <laughs> yeah, well, it's a great question. Obviously, it's probably the $10 million question in the middle of the room. Uh, the way that I approach it is, you know, somehow I get connected with a warm lead and opportunity. And then I basically commit an amount of time. Usually for me, it's an early intake call. It's about an hour. I'm slowed down. I've created space. The only thing I have in mind is just basically asking them initially. And I'm curious, what had you reaching out? What had you making contact? You know, and then they'll ideally give me some insight into that. So well, if you don't mind, just share a little bit more about, you know, how long that thing that you just mentioned has been occurring in your business or could be your life, but usually it's the business. They'll go on and say, okay, well, like, tell me what you've done up to this point in time, you know, to kind of remedy that. Like what, do you, what, and, and, and what's the impact and what if we, you didn't solve that? I mean, some of those probing questions, right? And usually I'm talking about five minutes with those kinds of questions out of an hour. And then what I want to get really good at doing is just saying, well, let me just summarize what I think I've heard. And, you know, and, and you can tell me if I've somehow misunderstood you, but here's what I think I heard you say. And now the question is with all of what you said and what you shared with me, what, if anything, do you want to do with that? Like what feels right to you? Um, and let me share what I do and how I could come a, alongside and be of a partner and a service to you. And if that feels like it's a fit, if you think that might help you solve it, great. If not, let me kind of tell you about some other resources I have that might be able to come in who are sort of affiliate partners of mine that, you know, have a specialty in that that I don't, you know, emphasize or don't focus on. So that, and it's all about serving. And I have, I learned this years ago when I worked for an organization as a delivery consultant for a, a company called uh, MPS. We would come in behind basically, you know, McKenzie, Booz Allen, Accenture, Bain and Company, and we would operationalize strategy for these massive companies like HP, et cetera. Um, and one of the guys who was on that consulting delivery team gave me a, an insight that I love, which is being a hundred percent committed, like unbelievably committed to what I do and the way I do it and totally unattached to the outcome. So that creates freedom, you know, and it creates authenticity and I can speak directly to people and often are very direct and, and, and I don't have a fear or concern that by being direct and clear that it would upset anything because I'm committed to what I do, but unattached to any outcome. When I was first in this business, I was highly attached to the outcome and probably not all that committed. You know, I just wanted to create some money and figure out how to get this thing off the ground and was working at healing my wounds and looking smart. And, all, and, and so I've just really matured into the role. And it's like, listen, if this doesn't work for you, great, no problem. I have no, but I will, if, if we work together, this is what it feels like. And then just give them a choice. And then I do like to get to yes, no, very quickly. So you try to close on the one call. I don't even look at it through the lens of closing. It's just like, you know, no, not using in one call. I, I, do, I don't like being sold that way. And so I don't like selling people that way. I like to let people have the opportunity to process because I'm a processor as well. So, you know, I just say, hey, listen, um, no need to make it say, here's what it looks like. Why don't you take, you know, talk to your wife, talk to your husband, talk to whoever you need to talk to your leadership team, figure out whether this feels like it's a fit for you. If it is, I'm going to put an appointment in my calendar to reach out to you. What do you think? Next Monday? Great. Next Monday. It'd be fantastic if by next Monday you could come to a yes, no decision. So there's not in the moment, but a predetermined time when I'm going to reach out to them that gives them time to go back and think about it. And I know that there's people who totally disagree with that and that's okay. I have no thing at all about another person's process because there's lots of people you and I've encountered them many times who are looking to get the clothes. They want the sale to me. That's not being of service to somebody. I don't want to be put in a situation where I feel 
and he was forced to make a decision right then without having given myself the benefit of doing what I like to do, which is sit with it for a minute. I think that's just thought. And, and sometimes these are you know large numbers. So, you know, I wouldn't expect anybody to make that decision right then. Yeah, I like that because you're you're making it seem from the start, I don't really care if this happens or not. If we work together, we work together. If not, no big deal. There's somebody else that'll come along that's interested. So you come from this point of no desperation, no attachments, no no connections. But hey, I like you and I know I can help you and I would like to work with you, but it's up to you to decide if you want to do it. Otherwise, I can't be bothered to like chase you. But let's give it a few days. So do you actually book a call with them in the calendar that you both agree upon or are you just like, I'm going to send you an email? Yeah, I, what I aspire to do is always book a call, a follow-up call. And if they're unwilling to do that or they don't have access to it, then I'll put it on myself saying, I'll call you, I'll reach out to you. And I always prefer, this is something I learned years ago um, at Gallo. You, you don't really ever want to give any kind of proposal, you know, like in an email. You always want to do a proposal over the phone if you can't do it in person. And there's lots of psychology behind why that's the case. But, you know, I, I, I cringe when I see people who, you know, send proposals via email and then don't have a conversation like we're having, right? There's a lot of reasons to have a personal conversation with somebody and or if even possible, you know, getting in front of somebody personally is the most effective. And then it just kind of goes down from there. And, 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 and there's reasons behind that. And so I, I always say, well, and if I don't get them, I won't send an email. I'll reschedule. If I don't get them, I won't send an email. I'll reschedule until I get them on the phone. And I say, hey, I want to walk through this proposal with you. Take, let me kind of share with you what's going on, et cetera. So if it's like a six or seven figure contract, would you fly to them? Would you like make an effort to be like, I want to meet you in person to do this? It's or? a great question. And I, I'd say it would depend. But more often than not, if it's at that level, absolutely. No question about it. But I guess you're working mostly with people in the U.S., right? Yeah, mostly. I, but I do have overseas clients for sure, yeah. Okay. Because, yeah, I mean, living in, in Europe, if I have a client in California, it's like 16 hours to fly from Europe to there. Um, yeah. As I know, because I flew from Lisbon to Amsterdam to Seattle recently for my friend's wedding. Yeah. And it was like 14 hours. Yeah, that, that, so that's a huge commitment. I would prefer not to have to. Yeah, I, I, I'd say you got to use your own discernment, right? To see what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Um, and I, I would get on a plane for something like that if the probability was really high. And I knew that from the conversations and the dialogue and the relationship and the back and forth. Then I'd get on a plane. And, and, and I see it more as a process. And, you know, the one thing I would say, going back to what you had commented on earlier is, you know, I, I, I share people, I share with people all the time. I am completely and hundred percent committed and totally unattached. And, and I say that from a place of authenticity because what happens is the minute I attach an outcome to anything that involves another person making a decision, I'm cooked because then that's, I can get into this whole, you know, pattern of disappointment, frustration, anger, you know, all the fear, all that stuff that, cascades and I just don't want that in my life. So that's, that's authentic. That's genuine. I don't use it as a sales ploy. It's just really true for me. What's the most important thing that you've learned in your life to date? I think the most important thing I've learned in my life is to not take myself too seriously. And I think broadly speaking, if everyone took themselves less seriously, we'd have a lot fewer challenges that we currently face right now, not just in the United States, but globally. Um, I think we're in a condition where people are taking themselves too seriously and we could all just chill out a little bit and things would work a lot better. That's my, I think that's what I've learned fundamentally.